been a long time. It's been eight weeks of silence. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your prayers. I think in this season of silence for your under shepherd, um, God has taught me to wake up every morning grateful for the voice that he's given me. I think as we sang just a song a moment ago, some of the, some of the words and the voice of God has, has um, struck me and um, made a profound impact in me in a way that I've never experienced before. When the psalmist says, be still, or some translation says, be silent and know that I'm God, it takes a different dimension when you can't use your voice. I think many of you have encouraged me through these, this season by giving me this certain voice um, verses that you think it would encourage me along the way. And many of you say, Pastor, you're just like Zacharias in Luke chapter 1. And you can read that later, but I wish some of you would read that before you told me that. <laughs> because what Zacharias did, God took his voice away because of his unbelief. <laughs> so I think I don't know if that was like a prophecy that you wanted to tell me because of my unbelief that God took my voice away. You were trying to give me encouragement. Another, from the nature and the realm of God's miracles, if you remember when Jesus was on the Sea of Galilee and he was calmly sleeping during a storm and disciples like us panic and we wake Jesus up and one of the disciples says, Lord, do you not care at this very moment we are in the process of perishing? And do you remember the first words that he said? He looked across the storm and said, what? Be silent. So I'm I'm wondering if I'm a storm that needs to be silent, or if I'm a Zacharias who has unbelief who needs to be silent. But I think I can identify with Job a little bit when he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I will bless the Lord. I think in the middle of all of this, there's just a certain um, element in the silence that the, prof, or the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, said in Ecclesiastes 5, and kind of a sober reminder, God is in heaven, we're on earth. Let your words be few. And so I think as God, I went through the frustration of not being able to speak, I went through so many times my boys were on the phone and I wanted to give a parental directive to them, and God was silent. Many of you had things that were going on that I wanted to provide some type of encouragement and I was silenced. When I would hear others preach, I was going, this is my call. I need to be up there. But I think what really began to resound in my, my prayer for you as well is that the voice of God would take priority over everything else. I think sometimes we, we um, hook in, or we line up or we connect with a human voice. And many of you said, Pastor, we miss your voice. And I appreciate that, but I think it's, I just want to remind you that this voice will not bring you hope. This voice does not offer salvation. This voice does not give you peace. It's the voice of God. And so today, under doctor's orders, I'm not to preach an entire message because we have no idea if I'm going to make it or not. And so my brother and our elder, Adrian, is going to help me in the middle of this journey. So my prayer is, as we come today, whether it's Adrian's human voice or my human voice, that that would pale in comparison to the voice of God. And so as we start today, um, we're really starting a sermon that we should have done a couple weeks ago because of the schedule. But um, several, a year ago, the leaders took a retreat and really came down to the um, very divine compelling that we should really adopt what we would call core values. And there are six of them. So over a period of time and much discussion, saturated in prayer, we came up with six core values. And today we start with the first one, which is to me the most important one. And the core values you see on the screen is Christ-centered. That everything we do centers around Jesus Christ. That he's our focus, that he's, um, he's the head of the church. And without him, there is no church. So he's the center. Second one, which will be in two weeks, because next week will be our launch of the year's theme, is the core value of Bible-based. Everything we do 
is based on the authority of the Word of God. Not tradition, not culture, not ethnicity, not preference, but the Word of God. The third core value is what we call prayer focus. That everything we do is saturated with prayer because prayer immediately reminds us that we are absolutely dependent upon God and we need help. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open. The fourth, fifth, and sixth core values were actually addressed in the book of Acts last, the latter part of last year. The fourth value is disciple making. This is a core value of IBC. We looked at the apostle Paul who was discipled first by Ananias then a brother that came along is Barnabas, and then he ultimately discipled Timothy and Titus and so many others. The fifth core value is unity in diversity. And we looked at the churches all the way through Acts, church at Corinth, church at Rome. There was no such thing as a Jewish church in Rome and a Gentile church at Rome. It was simply the church at Rome. The church is not composed of well, a language group. It's never divided based on language group, ethnicity, or culture, or tradition, or political party, or economic standing, or st social status. It is the church. And so our challenge, as you've seen displayed on stage, unity in the midst of diversity. That's the reason I'm wearing the Wu Dynasty shirt today. <laughs> unity in the midst of diversity. The sixth and the final one is mission-minded, which is our heartbeat. This is who we are, IBC. This is why we're here. So as we open up our Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 1 because we're going to target the first core value today. And I love Spurgeon. Spurgeon is one of my favorite pastors and preachers of times past. He was from um, London. And he always said, you could put me anywhere in Scripture and I will make my way to the cross. That nothing will stop me to get to Jesus Christ crucified. I, even the way we divide time in, in history is centered around the person of Jesus Christ. Now, if you put, as, as I said, Jesus is the center. If we have a time frame, and we call it B.C. Anybody remember what that word meant or that phrase, B.C.? Okay, some of you have taken a holiday of speaking back in these eight weeks I'm gone. So if I'm out of my silence, guess what you are? you're out of your silence as well. So you can speak back. BC stands for? Before Christ, right? And then anything after is called what? AD. Anno Domini, right? It talks about the year of the Lord. So everything, even history. I think sometimes we forget how Christ is saturated, not only dividing times of history, but even in the Old Testament. You open up the book of Genesis, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we understand from Colossians that Paul says Christ was the one who brought everything into existence. So he is the creator. In Genesis 3.15, many of you remember when um, God has given the, the, the punishment to, to the serpent. And he says, the seed of the woman, seed, singular, will crush the head of the serpent, which is a, a, a foreshadowing of the person of Christ. You go to the next book in Exodus and you see that the people in the plight of their slavery and oppression in Egypt and yet the Passover lamb as it spread across the door, remember that? The angel of death passed over and then we open up the gospel of John in John chapter 1 it says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All the way through the Old Testament, Christ is present. You turn to the next book in Leviticus and it gives you the garments and the regulations and all the rituals of the high priest and you come to Hebrews and it says Jesus Christ is our high priest. You come to the book of Numbers and you find the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness losing their way. And we come to John chapter 14 verse 6 when Jesus says I am the way that no one can come to the Father but through me. We look at the book of Deuteronomy which is literally the second law. And yet we come to Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 when he sees he is the fulfillment of the law. He's the lawgiver. Every book in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. He is the center not only of the church but of history, of the Old Testament. We go to the book of Joshua and Joshua encounters somebody before the battle. And it's called the captain of the Lord's army, Jesus Christ. We go to the book of Judges and we see all the judges begin to emerge. And yet ultimately we come to Revelation and we come to the final judge, Jesus Christ. The perfect, the ultimate judge. Then we come to the book of Ruth, small little book. But in that book it's introduced a, 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 a kinsman redeemer. Somebody in the family who buys, who purchases the right to redeem, to buy back into the family of God. Jesus Christ, kinsman redeemer. 
And so we come today to the book of Hebrews. So we're going to flip over to the New Testament. And and just a simple question. Who or or to whom is the book written? Hebrews. This is a tough one, obviously. I know we've been out out of sync for a little bit. But to whom is it addressed? Tough one, right? Hebrews. Which means they're Jews by blood. But they are also what we would call second generation Jewish believers. But in our church, we have the blessing of many of our people become our, 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 what I would call first generation believers. These are the ones that are the very first people who've opened their heart up to Jesus Christ and their family. So I would just want to take a moment and say, if you are a first generation believer, If you're the first one in your family, not your mom, not your dad, that you're the first one, no grandparents, if you're the first believer in your family, raise your hand just really quickly. Look around. Unbelievable here at IBC. How many of you were the first ones that opened their heart up to Jesus Christ? Well, these recipients are what we call second generation, which means their parents were Jews, they left Judaism and embraced Christianity. Then they had children. So this is written 50 plus years after the resurrection. So now we're talking about the children of the first generation. But what was happening as we read through Hebrews is that they were turning away from Christianity because of, and there's a long list, persecution, pressure from family. Many of you know that feeling. If you're the first generation believer, people are asking you, why are you chasing after the white man's religion? Why are you caving in to that radical faith? Come back home. Come back to family. Come back to our tradition. Come back to our culture. And so you can understand the pressure that the first, this, this, this second generation believers are enduring. Many of them lost their jobs. There were economic sanctions against Christians. Even politically, the the government itself was persecuting those who professed faith in Jesus Christ. And so you can understand why they were fading away of the temptation to. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, 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 no. If you're, if you're tempted, and, and, and even in our first, in here at IBC, there are many temptations for you to pull away from faith. But there's busyness. There, there's letdowns. There's, there's disappointments. There's God didn't complete or God didn't fulfill this promise to me. And, or there's physical illness or, or there's all kinds of, of pulls and lures into the world. And yet your heart is kind of growing cold. Well, this book is written for you and it's telling you, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Do not lose your focus. He's everything you need. If you're in darkness, he is the light of the world. If if you're struggling and you can't find your direction, you can't find your way, he's the good shepherd who will lead you in paths of righteousness for his namesake. If you have the stain of sin on you today and you come in here and you know that and you need forgiveness, he's the lamb of God. Jesus Christ is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If you're confused and you don't know which direction, you have all these options and they seem overwhelming, he's the wonderful counselor. If you're weak and you're powerless and you feel like you have no energy, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's everything you need. If you're troubled and you're turbulent and your marriage is in chaos right now and it's so much panic among our teenagers and our children and we've lost, it seems like there's no peace at all and he is the prince of peace. If you have an identity crisis and you've lost who you are, he's the great I am. Our Jesus is everything you need. If you come today and you have the stink and the smell of the world on you, the aroma of what this world has to offer, he's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's everything you need. And so we're going to open up Hebrews chapter 1. And we're going to introduce to you this Christ, the center. He, he's the focus. He's everything we need at IBC. He has to be a part of our foundational DNA. So Hebrews chapter 1, we will see that God speaks to us finally through Jesus Christ. And as we open up verse 1, we're going to see that he initially speaks through his prophets, but ultimately in verse 2, he will speak through his son. Now let's, you may not know, but let's read verses 1 through 4. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and many ways. And these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. And then the word of God says, and upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, 
Verse 4, having become as much better than angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Now we read that in the English, but in the original text, that verse 1 through 4 is one sentence. Would you say that's a long sentence? That's 72 words in the original text. How many of you would say that's likely it's a run-on sentence, right? 72 words. But let's look at the subject and the verb. The subject is the first word in the sentence. What is the subject in verse 1? IBC, this is your time to go vocal. God, right? And then the verb, and that obviously he's the primary subject, but the verb is the second word in verse 1 for the entire sentence. What is it? Spoke. See, this is where it all starts. There's a foundational, fundamental presupposition here that we cannot know God unless he makes himself knowable. We cannot see who he is unless he reveals himself. We cannot hear him unless he speaks. And so God is saying to us, he's about to reveal himself to us. And he's done it in the past in a certain way, but ultimately he's going to do it through Jesus Christ. So he's going to use what I would call a series of contrasts between one element, which I would call the prophetic history. Remember, these are Jewish believers. They have the history of the prophets and the Torah, the writings, the Old Testament, all of those things. The synagogue, the temple, the rituals, the washings, all of those. And so he's going to use a distinction between prophetic history and then he's going to bring a contrast to what I would call the present Christ. And he's going to do it through a, a couple methods. First is time. So verse 1, we'll talk about prophetic history. Verse 2, we'll talk about Jesus Christ. So let's do, look at your text again. And what is the one phrase in verse 1 that's a reference to time? So it's a phrase. God spoke what? Long ago. So that's in the past. Now look in verse 2. What is the reference to time? In the last days. So you get the sense that there's movement, do you not? Long ago, this is what it looked like, but now in the last days. So that means there's been progress. It hasn't stayed the same. It hasn't remained constant. There's now been movement. So let me give you some um, parallels that may help us understand. How many of you recognize the phrase snail mail? What is snail mail? Anybody remember? I love asking people in the, who are teenagers, what is snail mail? Okay, if you're over 18, what is snail mail? Post office, right? cards, letters, stamps, all of those things, right? Now, snail mail has become what? Email. Totally different, right? So there's progress. Now, some of you are going to give away your age because how many of you love math? Raise your hand. There's like four of you here. How many of you remember doing math? Let's make it more simple. Yeah, all of us, right? So, if you, this is going to reveal your age a little bit. How many of you remember doing math using an abacus? There was Methuselah here earlier in the service, and he did raise his hand. How many of you even know what an abacus is? Okay, so that's first math, okay? Some of you, um, some of you know this about my history. Um, I used to be embarrassed of this, like when I used, uh, lived in the U.S., but now when I moved to Asia, now I'm all proud about this. Um, it has a, um, I used to be in a club in secondary school, and it was called the Slide Rule Club. Anybody know what a slide rule is? Yeah, that's old school, right? I just look young as your pastor. Really, I'm not so young. So I was in the slide rule team. And so we went from abacus to slide rule for calculations. And from slide rule to what? Calculator. From calculator to what? Computer, right? So you see progress. Even in creation, I mean, several centuries ago, but humanity thought that the earth was the center of the universe. Recalculations, right? Now the sun is the center of our universe for a while, but now we realize that we're really one little system in a place called the Milky Way galaxy, which happens to be one of billions of galaxies in the universe. How would you say there's been progress, right? Well, this is what God said. He started a long time ago, but now in the last days. Second contrast is the recipients. Look in verse 1. Who Long ago, did God speak to, in verse 1? Who's the target audience? Fathers, our fathers, our forefathers. In verse 2, who's the target audience? Us. In the last days, it's spoken to us, right? Then, who's the conduit, or who's the spokesperson, in verse 1? Long ago, God spoke to our fathers through whom? 
prophets, the last days, God speaks through whom? Sons. So how many of you see progress, movement, right? So God has been talking, he's been revealing, but as time progresses, the revelation becomes fuller and fuller and fuller. But he said he spoke to us in many portions, which means it was fragments. It was never full. In pieces, never the whole plate. He spoke to us here, a little bit here, a little bit there. And he spoke in many ways, which means he spoke through rituals, he spoke through the law, he spoke through prophets and prophecy, he spoke through proverbs, he spoke through dreams and visions and face-to-face -face encounters. But now he has spoken to us, how? In his son. The son is the full, complete revelation of Jesus Christ, of God. Everything we need to know ultimately lands with him. And I love it because the full of the revelation is based on the full of the relationship. When you have God, the Father, and God, the Son, you get complete, total revelation. Where prophets were fragments and bits and pieces over a long period of time. And so now we come to that element where he is everything we need. And so we're going to challenge you again. God's spoken to us through his prophets, many portions, many ways, long time ago. But now to us, right now, we have full, complete revelation of Jesus Christ. He is everything. Now the second part of the message, this is where I'm going to ask Adrian to help me a little bit, is that he not only spoke to us fully in his son, but when he reveals himself in Jesus Christ, he will give us everything we need. So the middle of verse 2 to the end of verse 3, there are going to be six, what I would call characteristics or traits of Jesus Christ, of who he is. As Christopher led us just a moment ago, he was saying, if we know who he is, that we're going to respond a certain way. And so we're going to make a very clear declaration. This preacher, this writer of Hebrews, is talking to an audience just like you. And he's calling us to put our focus, our heart, everything we center upon, upon Jesus Christ. And these are the elements. And each of these elements will describe who he is. And I'm going to take the first one, and my brother is going to take number two and three, and I'll come back and finish the rest. But I want you to see, as we reveal, as the Word of God reveals who He is, it's going to also reveal a little bit about us as well. So we pick up the first one. It says, in the last days, He has spoken to us in His Son. Whom, and what's the next, the very first characteristic of who Jesus is? What does it say in your scripture? Whom He appointed what? Heir, Heir of all things. That word appointed means destined to possess. How many of you have inherited something? Just raise your hand. Now, let me kind of clarify this because a lot of times we confuse inheritance with lots of things. But how many of you, is it possible to inherit poverty? <laughs> Absolutely, right? We can inherit debts. We can inherit lots of things. Some of you say, I didn't get anything from my parents. Oh, yes, you did. You got their genes. You inherited their, their, their jawline. You in, and I inherited my father's... Um, premature graying hair. I, I, you know, we, we inherit a lot of things, right? So it's not just things that are being passed down like millions of dollars or millions of dollars in debt. There are other things we inherit. So all of us are inheritors. Would you agree? Okay, now, Jesus, the Word of God says, whom he appointed, who he destined to be heir of all things, which means everything he controls. Everything he has authority over. Everything he has power over. When you inherit something, now it becomes yours. And so, simple question. If he is heir of all things, do all things include you? Yes. Okay, y'all been silent for eight weeks a little bit too long. If he inherits and he is an heir to all things, do all things include you? Yes. So he controls you. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Now, how many of you have things? Everybody has things, right? And we use a lot of times, those are my things. Well, if he inherited all things, and all things include you, and everything you own now belongs to whom? Okay, some of you are not doing the spiritual math and calculations on this. If he is heir of all things, and all things include you, is that correct? Yes. And everything you own is also included in all things, right? Yes. And if he is destined to possess, and he is sovereign, and he's Lord, and he has authority, and he controls, is your things now, be, now become his things? Yes. Some of you are not doing this willingly, I can tell. 
I, and let me put it in terms, because I think sometimes we do the conceptual things in, in, in the pulpit or in preaching and in church on Sunday mornings. But let me put it in terms that maybe you can understand. Uh, in our first pastorate, I was in my mid-20s, and we were making a visit. And as, as we were making a visit, it was a crisis situation. I needed to go to the house. And it was a long day, and Sasha and I were in the car together. And so I said, um, hey, I'm going to stop. And she, it was, she said, hey, why don't you just... And we drove up, and it didn't look like anybody was at home. She said, why don't you go and knock on the door and see if they're there? And then if they are, I can come and meet you. I said, okay. So it was right there. So we, I went through the front little um, cyclone fence gate and walked up to the porch, and I knocked. And I heard noise. Now, and nobody came to the door. I know none of you tried to evade your pastor. Amen? <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, but when you hear something, you know they're there. So I started getting louder and louder. I was shouting their names. And, and nobody, but I could hear somebody stirring inside. And so finally, after three or four minutes, I gave up. And I said, I'll get them with the judgment of God a little bit later. And so I was walking out of the gate, and, I was, and, and all of a sudden, as I'm walking down the front porch, and out of the right corner of my peripheral, there was a sight to see. Around the corner, there was, all I could see was canine teeth. They had a dog, a massive dog. And he was running so fast from the backyard to the front to get to me that when he turned the corner, his body was at a 45-degree angle. So he was running so fast, he turned the corner going this way. And all I could see was teeth. Now, in that church, I had a history of visiting a lot of people who had dogs, and every single owner said, Pastor, my dog never bites. Until me. I was always the first one. My calculation was, those dogs in that particular area love Chinese food. So here he was coming around. And so my natural reaction for your courageous and your bold pastor is to do what? Run for my life. And so I took off and I forgot to close the gate as I was running out. And as I was closing the gate, now Sasha and I have kind of like a fun relationship sometimes. And sometimes we put ourselves in or put the other in a position to learn new revelations about the other person. And so as I was running to open the door, she hit the automatic lock button. <laughs> and so now I'm running around the car with this vicious dog chasing me, looking for Chinese buffet. And finally, I jumped on, and I love this, I jumped on the bonnet, or for those from the West, on the hood. And the dog was barking. And then, okay, that was all that. But then something miraculously happened. Around the backyard, there was a little boy. He was three years old. He comes out, and all he's wearing is underwear. No shirt, no shorts, underwear. And he's a little guy. And all of a sudden, he's running around, and he says, Buster! And I mean, that dog immediately stopped put his tail between his legs and scampered to the owner. Now, why couldn't I do that? And why could that little three-year-old boy with underwear could? <laughs> because it was his dog. He owned that dog. That was his. Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. That includes you and me and everything else we own. And if we truly say he is the heir of all things, then our proper response is, we belong to you. I'm going to let Adrian come, and he's going to introduce the second characteristic of Jesus Christ. I'm enjoying the sermon. I wish I didn't have to come up. I still think it's the underwear, Pastor. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to move on. Uh, ignore my Chinese New Year voice. If you listen to it long enough, you might sound like Pastor Rodney over time, okay? So the second point, Jesus Christ is the creator. That's why you've got to be Christ-centered. But not only is he the creator, he's, he's got all the credentials to be the creator of the universe, right? In John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing that has been made were made. So if you break it down, 
That's all the credentials of Jesus Christ right there. In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus' eternity. He was, from, he was there in the beginning. He was with God. That's his authority. He's, he was with God right there in the beginning of time. And the Word was God. That's his deity. He was God. He was with God in the beginning. That's his history. He was right there from day one. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing that was made that has been made. That's Jesus' agency. God did not just create. He created through Jesus. Jesus is the creator. So if Jesus is the credible creator, shouldn't we be paying more attention to our creator? But sometimes we pay more attention to our man-made stuff. We pay attention to stuff that we've created rather than to God, you know. So sometime back, I tried to learn computer programming. I, I learned BASIC. Have, have I heard of BASIC programming? I don't know, but I don't know about you, but BASIC to me is not BASIC at all, you know. And I'm not the kind of person who would like to look at a manual to figure out what the creator had in mind for each of the syntax. So if you can't figure out the intention behind the syntax, you can't put programming languages together and you can't get code to work. It's the same way with us and God. If God is the creator, he's got intent for us. Everything that he's created has got a purpose, including us. But we go to so many other places for purpose, for intention, and we totally ignore God. So if we want to go back to being right with God, we got to go back to the creator. We got to go back to the manual. What's this manual, my ass? The manual is the word of God. Where is this manual? It's inside our heart. It's the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus is the manual, the Holy Spirit. If we don't go back to the manual, if we don't go back to the Holy Spirit, then all we are are like malfunctioning bits of code running around. Or to put it in the words of Isaiah, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. So by the way, speaking of computer stuff, how many of you spend maybe an hour, more than an hour each day online in some kind of activity? Okay, quite a number of hands. How many of you spend an hour in prayer or in reading God's word each day? Very much fewer hands. So what are we? What are we plugged into? Are we plugged into the world of <clears throat> Facebook? Are we plugged into the world of uh, social media, YouTube? Or are we plugged into the God's world? Are we more familiar with Fortnite Battle Royale? Or are we more familiar with the battle that's raging right now in the heavenly realms? What are we plugged into? That's what it means to be turning, to be Christ-centered to, to Christ, the creator of the universe. Now, Christ is not only the creator. <coughs> Excuse me. Christ is not only the creator. He is the creator of us. Psalms 139 says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways, and before a word is on my mouth, you know it already. God knows how we are wired. He knows how we are, we are going to behave because he is our creator. It says, you created me and in my inmost being. You knit me in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's time to go back to our creator. He not only created the world, the universe, he created us. Next point, full revelation of God. Jesus is not only the creator, he is the full revelation of God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. There is no more after him. If you want to know God, just go to Jesus. He is the full, complete revelation. And he's also the radiance of God. He is the exact representation of his nature. Let's, let's break those down. What does it mean to be the radiance of God's glory? Let's first understand what is God's glory. God's glory is essentially his face. To behold God's glory is to behold his face. 
the fullness of his beauty, his holiness, his majesty. And let me tell you, you cannot behold God's face and live. In Exodus 33, verse 18, Moses, he had an audience with God, and he tried this. He said, God, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see my face and live. So that's the glory of God. No one can behold it. But yet, in the Bible, it says Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. All right? I kind of understand it this way. Right? We are the earth. We're here on earth. And the sun is here. And the sun is bright, and the sun gives sunlight to us. And we here on earth receive the light. We get nourished, we get warm, and we're happy. But if we look at the sun directly, what happens to us? Our eyes get blind. If we go too close to the sun, what happens to us? We burn up. But the rays come from the sun. The rays and the sun are one, just like Jesus and the Father is one. Many years, one of the disciples of Jesus, Philip, he tried to do the same thing that Moses did. He said, Lord, Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus told him, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been amongst you for so many, such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you then say, Show me the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. So that's what it means to have Jesus, the radiance of his glory. He comes from the Father. He is the exact representation of the Father, of the Father's nature. If you, if you um, go to the money changer and you receive some dollar notes after changing the money, and the dollar note doesn't look quite right to you. Maybe the size is too big or the color is off or they misspelled some name wrongly. Would you be satisfied with the note? Probably not, right? It's fake notes, all right? If you use fake notes, it will land you in hot soup. You'll get a jail sentence. But you want real notes because those real, real notes get real transaction power. So Jesus is not a fake note. Jesus is the real deal. He is no different from God. And not only is Jesus the exact representation of God, he is slightly different in only one way, and that is that he has human nature. He's the exact representation of God, God's nature, except that he's also fully human. The Bible says in, um, where is it? Yeah, it says in, he, in Hebrews later that we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus is the one who wept, he bled, he hungered, and he thirsted. At one point in time when he was walking through Samaria, he got so tired that he had to sit down by the well and ask for a drink of water from a woman by the well. The humanity in him caused him to be tired and to ask for water. But the deity in him allowed him to say this, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, this water I will give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's deity and humanity. So Jesus is the exact representation of God. He is the radiance of God's glory. And that's why we can approach Jesus, because we have one who is able to 
empathize with us completely. And yet, when we approach him, it's like us beholding his glory. But we've got to be careful here. When we approach Jesus, we've got to be careful not to approach him the wrong way. Sometimes I hear amongst brothers and sisters, and they say, you know, I, th- I like to think of Jesus as, and they fill in the blank, you know, as, as a giver, as a provider, or as ATM, whatever, you know. And, and the way it was, it was, it was said, it, it almost sounds like you're making out Jesus to be the one they want to be, rather than Jesus being the one who really is. There's a big difference between, I like to think of Jesus as an ATM versus I am encountering Jesus as the giver of good gifts. Big difference. So when we approach Jesus, let's make sure that we are not approaching a fake representation of our own making. Let's make sure we're approaching Jesus as the full and exact representation of God's nature. So I'm going to hold, hand back to Pastor Rodney now. So a quick review. Jesus Christ is, number one, heir of all things, which means he owns everything here, including us and everything we have. Second, he is creator through whom he made the world. Third, he is the full revelation of God. Then we come to the fourth. It says, through also in whom upholds all things by the word of his power. And so I'm going to put the, char- uh, the characteristic, and I'm going to put it in our terms, sustainer. Sustainer. The word upholds means to obviously bear up, to carry. But I think sometimes we have uh, the Greek mythology image of Atlas. Many of you know the scene, right? Where Atlas is carrying what on his shoulder? The whole world, right? But he looks like he's not moving so well. He's not so mobile. And yet, that's not the word. It means not only to hold and to to, to bear up, but actually to carry it to its fruition, to carry it to its rightful conclusion. And so God says, through whom he he upholds all things. So that, and how does he do it? By the word of his power. We just talked with, with our brother Adrian, talked about creation. If you go back to Genesis 1, that word of power spoke creation into being. He said, let there be light, and there was what? Light. With a word, he separated the heavens. With the word, he brought vegetation. With the word, he created man. Just with the word. That same word, that same power, also sustains us as well. I know sometimes we get disheartened. We get depleted of all of our energy. We're spiritually fatigued. We're exhausted. And, and I promise you, over these last eight weeks, I've learned something. It takes more energy to be quiet than to speak. And I've had to go back again and again and again and say, he's my sustainer. He upholds all things by, the, by his word, not by my word, by his voice, not by my voice. That same voice that spoke into creation continues to uphold creation that will bring it to its final conclusion at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That one that sent that one voice crying in the wilderness, John the Baptist. That one that sent the words to the prophets. He always spoke. He always spoke. Whether it was Martin Luther in the Reformation, whether it was William Carey with the missions, whatever it was, even today, God upholds you by the word of his power. You are here today and you may be depleted. And yet him, Jesus Christ, will uphold you with the word of his power. Many of you are familiar with the New Year's Day celebrations. And especially in the U.S., they have a famous parade called the Rose Parade in California. On this particular occasion, um, it was televised, and you have hundreds of floats. They're beautifully arrayed with flowers and decorations and themes and people and all that kind of stuff. But one particular float, it was televised, but one particular float all of a sudden halted. And it caused a delay to the entire parade because this float ran out of petrol. Gas. No gas. So someone had to go get a can to fill up with petrol and pour it into the gas tank and petrol tank and container there in order for the, for the parade to proceed. Now, ironically, the one who sponsored that float, you might recognize the name, 
the Standard Oil Company. <laughs> now, they may get depleted, but our God is infinite in his resources. So I'm telling you, if he is the sustainer, that tells us who we are. We are dependent upon him. We can do nothing apart from him. Jesus Christ says in John 15, he says, Abide in me and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so today, he's the center of our church. And if he's the center, he is the sustainer. There's nothing he will not... Is he, is he incapable of carrying us through to it, our, our rightful conclusion? Now we come to the fifth one. It says, when he made purification of sins. So I'm going to put the category of the title, Redeemer. So when he made purification of sins, that means he cleanses us, he forgives us, he relieves us of that. Now you have to understand, this is a Jewish audience. So they understood what redemption is. They understood what purification. And in their mind, purification took place annually on the Day of Atonement. That's when the priest went into the Holy of Holies on the day on Yom Kippur and offered that, that sacrifice. But the problem, I mean, obviously it covered the sins for that particular year, but the problem with that process was it, it was temporary, which means it had to be repeated annually, year after year after year, which means it wasn't sufficient. But the writer of Hebrews, as well as Paul in Romans, says very clearly when it comes to Christ's death, that Christ's death, he died once and for all. Now, true, the creation of the world is based on God's power and Christ's power, but the redemption, the purification, the cleansing, it rests upon the sacrificial death of the crucified one. And once and for all is done. Nothing needs to be added. And so if you are here today and you come in as a sinner, I want you to know that Christ is a redeemer. Then we come to the last one. It says, when he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So all of those words are going to put into one title and name him king. When you sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high, the right hand represents power, authority. It represents a, a realm of control. It represents that there, there is a sense of kingdom. And it says that he sat down. And there's a very strong image of sitting down. When someone sits down, it means the work is accomplished. Nothing needs to be added. Nothing needs to be extended. The work is complete and the Father has accepted the sacrifice. Jesus Christ, as Romans says, he is the just and the justifier. He was the one that was pure, but he also was the one that made us pure. By his death, he brought us into the family of God and he sat down. Work complete. Work done. Before we move on and we close here, I just want to make a quick analogy and uh, observation. Every time you see angels in Scripture... They're also in a physical posture. Anybody know what they're known for? What, is the physical, what are angels physically doing when you see them in Scripture? They're either standing or falling. But they're never sitting. Because the only one who sits is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so he needs to be in his rightful place. So as we come to a conclusion this morning... We've given you a very clear picture according to Hebrews, the spokesperson. God speaks ultimately through Jesus Christ. And we've given you six characteristics. What are they? Number one, he's what? Heir of all things. Owns everything. Everything we possess. Second, creator. Third, full revelation of God. Fourth, sustainer. Fifth, redeemer. Sixth, now we know who he is. Would you say you have a better picture of who Jesus is? But you know, this picture of who he is, by implication, tells us who we are. Isn't that amazing? When we see God, we also see who we are. So let me give you an example. If he's heir of all things, guess who we are? We belong to him. If he's creator, what are we? Creation. If he's the full revelation of God, that means that we must acknowledge who he is and stand in awe. If he is sustainer, that means we are dependent. If he is redeemer, who are we? Sinners. And if he is king, who are we? His servants. So we close today. I want to just come with a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul says, I believe, therefore I speak. I think sometimes in 21st century version of Christianity, especially here in Singapore, we try to separate our belief from our speaking. But if you go back to Romans 10, verse 9, it says, If we confess with our mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. 
Biblically, you cannot separate belief from speaking. So we're going to challenge you today. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? And as you come to that, there's going to be one title that may mean something more than another title. It may be one of these six. And we're going to ask each person here to make a bold declaration verbally. If there's true belief inside of you, belief produces speech. I believe, therefore I spoke. If we confess Jesus Christ as Lord with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Culture, society, shyness, timidity, personality, tried to separate belief and speaking. Biblically, you cannot. And so we're going to challenge you. Pastor Lloyd mentioned this several weeks ago when he remembered the, the, the message in 2010, I believe, on Joshua. When we ask everybody to, to make a bold declaration. Anybody remember that? And what was the bold declaration? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we're going to challenge you to go verbal. We're going to challenge you, whatever you believe about Jesus Christ, that you speak it. And that when you do it, I'm going to ask you to do two things. One, stand up. Second, speak clearly, courageously, and boldly. And after you stand and speak whatever that might be, then I'm going to ask you to remain standing. We want to clearly understand. Because we can't call this church to be Christ-centered if Christ is not the center of your heart. Now, you can use one of these six titles, but it's not limited to that. You can say, Christ is Emmanuel, God with me. You saw the worship leaders say, God is my refuge, my very present help in time of need. God is my way maker. God is my rock. God is my shelter. That Christ is, is, is that to me. You might want to say, he's my wonderful counselor, my prince of peace. You might want to say he's my resurrection. You might want to say he's my life. You might want to say he's my hope. And I'm going to lead us out. After this time of prayer, I'm going to make the first bold declaration. Because in this season of silence, Jesus Christ has taken on a different angle that I've never had before. I could tell you a lot of things Jesus has been to me in, in my past. And, and a lot of those times he's been for decades. But these last eight weeks, Jesus Christ has taken a different angle in my heart that has become very dear in my silence. And so I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. Then we're going to make a bold declaration. Again, I believe, therefore I speak. If you're here today and you say, I believe, we're going to challenge you to speak. We're going to challenge you to, to verbalize, to vocalize. To, to give that, authentic, uh, that validation and that authentication of, of that heart belief to the mouth confession. And many of our people, have, it's been powerful as you hear, Jesus Christ is my help. Jesus Christ is my light and my darkness. Jesus Christ is my redeemer. Jesus Christ is my hope. Jesus Christ is my everything. <coughs> Jesus Christ is my prince of peace, whatever it might be. But let's prepare our hearts as we as a church place Christ in his rightful place. Father, we come to you tonight, today and with a very tender heart for the word of God. Father, you have been placed front and center, not only in the book of Hebrews to a group of Jews that were struggling with slipping back into safety, with cowering, in the middle of crisis, of surrender and yielding to peer and family pressure to walk away from the faith, to allow circumstances to control. For I pray that today as back then, that our people would boldly declare who you are, that with their belief there would be that faith speaking, that there would be no hesitation at all. Father, today we offer ourselves to you as a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to you, which is our spiritual service of worship. Father, we want to declare our allegiance to you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're here and the Spirit of God does not move you, I'm going to ask you just to remain seated. 
only as those who are being prompted by the Spirit of God living inside of you to declare who Jesus Christ is. Don't worry about anybody else. Just pop up however God's Spirit moves you, and I'll start. Jesus Christ is the Word. I've been silent for a long time, and that Word has become more and more and more precious. His voice has, has outweighed any other voice of humanity. I've longed to hear his voice in my silence now. And I want to declare to the world and to my Lord that Jesus is the word. Let God's spirit move your heart. Boldly stand, courageously tell the world, I believe, therefore I speak. Jesus is. Boldly declare what Jesus is to you. See your guide, see your shepherd, see your faithful father. Who is Jesus? Just a moment more as we give you a chance to declare. And once you declare, remain standing. If you're here today and you're not and you haven't embraced Jesus Christ, today you can walk out of here today with this simple statement, Jesus is my Lord. It could be a transfer of ownership. The transaction could immediately take place. And you've been sent here by God to be challenged with a simple declaration that is profound. I'm going to ask Chris to lead us. And this will be not only a, a, a song to invite you to respond, but it will also be our prayerful benediction. Um, we have a deacon, our, our deacon Keith. Um, he's going to be available with his wife Stella. They're going to be at the guest center right in the back, and they're going to be available if you want to talk. If, if, if you want to have someone pray with you after this song, we will be available, the deacons and the elders as well. But I'm also, also going to encourage each of you who spoke that you would share with at least two people what you said and why you said it. Because I think when you align Jesus Christ in your heart, it begins to spread out into your relationships and to your home as well. So I'm going to ask for the rest of you, if you could stand now, and let's respond with this very powerful and profound song, Christ is the center of it all. <laughs> 